have a lot of fond memories tied up in the original Thief games. Nights stayed up with the lights turned off and my headphones smushing my ears against my scalp. I waited in the shadows for footsteps down the hall to fade away. Fast forward to 2013, the year of hand wringing and gnashing of teeth as longtime fans of the Thief franchise eagerly awaited the release of a sequel. Finally, the fans were getting what they wanted. We would finally get to complete our journey with Garrett, the lovable cat burglar and sometimes murderer. But all was not well, no, an event had transpired on the internet, an event so monumental that gamers left their dark dwellings to shout out into the harsh hot sunlight, their excitement for a gameplay trailer it was about to be released. Nothing could sully the excitement of this moment, not even the naysayers. See, they tried to tell us that the game would not be the second coming of Dionysus, resurrected into a sweet grape. No, V4, in the eyes of skeptics, was going to be a sort of sour, dried up fig for which no sweet wines could be squashed from. A gameplay trailer was released and I, with the rest of the fanbase, sat and waited as the green ESRB faded in. The content of the following trailer has not been cleaned and sanitized for your eyes. Shield them, for you may be blinded by the awesome magnificence that is the Thief trailer. Wow. I said as I watched it. Looks pretty. Garrett appears on screen and a cold chill runs up my back and then he speaks. Uh, that's not Garrett. Where's Steven Russell? Another trailer, this time with gameplay, the first hour of gameplay. Who the fuck is this emo guy? And who the fuck is that emo girl? What the fuck is going on? Okay, alright, surely this will get better. Oh god, rope arrows only in specific places, is this Tomb Raider? Linear routes through the level, cutscenes interrupting everything, taking you out of the experience, terrible dialogue, small cramped vents, Oh no, oh god, what have they done to Thief? Suffice to say that when Thief came out, I was not an early adopter. I waited until it went on sale for about $5, then I bought it. When I played through the first two hours of this game, I put it down. I really did not want to play it anymore. It was tedious. It was a linear experience that seemed to kill any sense of freedom from the previous games. Why did this game fail so hard? I mean, it should have been a slam dunk. They didn't need to change much about the gameplay, so why the hell did they muck about with every single system in the game? Let's dig in, shall we? Level design. Now, this game doesn't trust you. The first few hours of this game takes you by the hand and leads you down a single linear path to very specific goals with very little deviation between. Let's look at some of the maps. Let's compare some of the Thief 1 maps to Thief 4's maps and see if we can spot the difference. Now Thief 4 Chapter 1 starts you off in a linear corridor, which then splits you into what looks like a more open space, but really, if you examine the map closely, you'll start to notice something. Everything is built in an arena style. Hallways connect what are essentially stealth arenas where you must choose one or two paths around guards. It is here that you feel like the game is starting to herd cats, because while there might be three paths through an area, only one path is ever the safe one. The levels feel tight and compact compared to what we were used to in the Thief games, and the result feels like you're taking part in the world's most complicated game as Simon says. Whenever I failed, it didn't feel like something I did wrong, but felt more like I didn't do the sequence in the correct order. So let's take Bafford's Manor for a great example of Thief's brilliant level design, and also as a contrasting point. Now we start off in a more linear area, much like Thief 4, but this quickly changes once we've traversed the sewers and popped out into a storeroom. From here, we are on rails until we are out into the main hall, which branches off into two separate paths that all lead to the same place, the stairs of the first floor. It is here that the game opens up. You are given the freedom to traverse the manor in any way you see fit, and because the level is designed like a house and not a series of corridors connecting arenas, it feels like you are really a thief, trespassing in someone else's home. From the time you exit the basement, there's not one, not two, not even three, but four different paths that you could take. And it only opens up from there. Rooms in the manor are connected in a way that makes sense because it is designed like a home. 
See, the point of a thief game is to feel like a thief. But how can you feel like a thief when the first three hours of Thief 4 is just you traversing city streets with one or two paths to choose from? See, the main difference as I see it is that Thief the Dark Project followed a very open-ended design where the entirety of the level is at your disposal from the moment you get in-game. Don't have a key to get into a door? Knock out a guard and take it off his body. Or lockpick the door. Or sneak in through a route into another room. Or wait for a guard to open the door. The point is, the levels were designed with loops in mind. If you look at this map, you can see what I mean. See, a loop, in this sense, is a design where if you keep turning the same direction, you'll eventually be back where you started. Notice that nearly every room in Bafford's Manor has two entrances, and some go as far as having four or five. When you give the player this kind of freedom, you give them the ability to play the way they want to which is why the original game was able to vary the gameplay objectives so wildly with each difficulty level. No knockout runs of this game were made possible only because of the myriad choices that you had. Not only are there loops, but those loops lead into one another. That distinction will become important later when we examine the level design of Chapter 2 in Thief 4. Now take a look at this map. Are you starting to notice a pattern here? Take a look at the linear progression of this map. From your starting location to the very end of it, you can draw a twisting line through the entire thing, which is, once again, a series of stealth arenas connected by hallways that only rarely branch off into tiny self-contained areas. You are essentially on rails once again, and the map only gives you occasional distractions in the form of side rooms. Gone are the designs that loop back in around themselves naturally when the game does have loops, they don't loop into one another, because none of the rooms are connected in any meaningful way. What is most disappointing about this level is, upon examination, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. This place is a factory essentially, a place where corpses of the gloom victims go to be processed and incinerated. They put the bodies on hooks and send them down the line of the incinerator. Here's the issue. Draw a line that starts from the beginning of the hook line to the end. And you might start asking yourself, why the fuck did they build this place this way? From the starting point to the end point, the course makes no less than eight turns and ends up mere yards away from where it started. So, what you're saying is, it is more efficient to send corpses down this rail instead of building a walkway from here to here, where the incinerator actually is. I mean, look at this map. Do people really have to walk all that way without shortcuts to the Sheriff of Nottingham's office? Now, I did a redesign of the map, and... Personally, I think that this is the way most Thief maps should be designed. I only rearranged the rooms in the maps and added paths, rooms, etc. to open up the map a little. Rooms and halls I have added are in blue, and secret routes like vents are in purple. I also arranged the rooms so the entire level is more of a square, which I think is much more in line with the original Thief games. Now notice all the loops. These loops are an important design element of a Thief game, and just about any game that allows for choice because each loop opens up new routes for the player to take from one place to the next. The point of Thief was, even though you were able to go right for the objective at any time you wanted, doing so meant you wouldn't have any money to spend on items in the next level. The reason Thief 4 couldn't do this is because it didn't follow the Thief mission structure. Thief games have always been about breaking into a place and stealing something. Thief 4 is about going into a mission, watching cutscenes, then stealing something. The reason the cutscenes get in the way is because in order to ensure that the cutscenes are watched, you have to make sure that the player doesn't break the constructed series of events that you've designed. The result of wanting a more cinematic experience is having a game that plays very by the numbers and doesn't inspire player creativity. In a looped map, enemy placements and patrol routes can be longer and more complicated because the player has at their disposal many routes in and out of a given area. In a more restricted and linear map, those options get severely limited. 
and therefore you have to limit the intelligence of the AI, just to make it fair. Now let's look at Thief Gold's second level for contrast. Cragscleft Prison is a massive map. A map that spans seven floors, all of which are sprawling, exploration-heavy areas with multiple paths. Take the caves, for instance. At the bottom levels, the caves are connected by an old elevator that will only take you up to certain floors, which forces you to do some exploring if you want to get to your objective in the upper levels of the complex. Notice anything about these maps? That's right! They're loops! All paths eventually converge on the first level, and on the second level, it becomes a series of loops. The reason these loops are a good design decision is because you are not alone down there in the caves. You are being chased by zombies that can only be killed with holy water arrows, and since you have a limited supply of water arrows, you may find yourself running the hallways trying to lose whatever's chasing you. Loops help facilitate that, but they also give you several options for infiltration. This is the factory area. Notice the one major loop in the map? From the time you enter this area, you are given a staggering amount of options. First, notice that there are not one, not two, but three ways to get to the prison area from the main loop. It is only once you get to the foundry that your path forward is limited to one route, but even then, the game gives you several options. You can take the safe route above, the arguably tougher route below at the foundry floor, or do a combination of both, using the stairs that connect each area in a horseshoe path. Even when the developers forced you through an area, they still allowed you to do it your way. In Chapter 3 of Thief, the game opens up slightly, and suddenly you have maybe two options that will dump you out at different points in a level, but even with this limited freedom, the game has something holding it back. See, the game was designed for consoles. Now, I'm not trying to be a PC Master Race guy. I own a console, and you know, but there are some inherent flaws with consoles. The biggest flaw is a lack of memory. The PS4, for example, has 8 gigs of GDDR, which sounds like a lot, but it isn't. See, if the PS4 had RAM and VRAM like a computer, it would be a lot more versatile and be able to handle things like bigger levels. But since video shares the same RAM as everything else, you get bottlenecked quickly. You can see the concessions the developers had to make very clearly in the design of these levels. Areas in certain levels are cut off by tight spaces that, when looking at the map, just don't make any damn sense. The only reason they exist is the high loading screens in the open world. See that huge map? It doesn't load in all at once. It loads in in chunks. And the rest is loaded in as you squeeze through those tight alleyways. Not only does this break up the flow of the level, but it does something else. It forces you, the player, to rely on a map, because there is no organic way to memorize these twisting masses of levels when they're broken up by so many loading screens. Now god damn it, Thief 3 had the same problem. It was the same problem we complained about in Thief 3. What the fuck are you doing? Don't give us an open world. We don't like the open world in Thief games. We didn't like it in 3. We don't like it in 4. I just don't understand this. Now take Mission 2 for a great example of this. See, you're not riding a hook line because it's a sensible means of travel. No, sir. This is a loading screen. Notice here in this clip that the room beyond is black until I pass through the occlusion barrier. Suddenly, ta-da, a level. The limitations of the platform clearly influence the design of this game, and much to the detriment of the experience. Now, Speaking of experience, how did gameplay fare in this reimagining of Thief? Well, not great. Alright, let's talk about gameplay. So in order to tackle all of my complaints here, I need to list them out. Okay, because if my five things I hate video is any indication, people love lists. So my list is as follows. Number one, everything is a cutscene. Number two, everything is contextual. Number three, everything is valuable, sort of? Number four, everything is simplified. And number five, everything is silent. Now, let's start with number one. Everything is a cutscene. 
Literally all your actions in this game come from a canned animation. You've seen cutscenes. We all have at some point in our life. Cutscenes can be a good way to impart some information that would be prohibitive to do during gameplay. Think about what a cutscene is and what it does to gameplay. A cutscene is basically a film break that takes place in between gameplay when you reach a trigger in a world that is invisible to the player. In the game world, there are all kinds of things that you, the player, cannot see. Cameras, light nodes, dummy nodes, waypoint nodes, etc. The list goes on. But what does a cutscene do to gameplay? Well, it brings it all to a crashing halt because you're no longer playing a game, you're watching it. There's nothing wrong with that. If used sparingly, it could be a nice break from non-stop action. But when you use it the way that Thief does, it becomes detrimental to the experience. And so, let me explain myself. When I say everything is a cutscene, what I mean is... Nearly every action you take pulls you out of the game to complete the action which you cannot interrupt and cannot move while it happens. Take the simple act of opening a fucking door! An action that in the first Thief game was simple, elegant. It's now been turned into a cutscene that wrests control away from the player for an entire three seconds. In this clip, I'm in a jewelry store with the guards, and I want to close the door behind me, but in the three seconds it takes to close the damn door, I am detected. The other problem with this is because it is a cutscene, it doesn't take into account the fact that I am crouched to hide myself and forces me to stand up, putting me in clear view of the guards. And nearly every action is like this. From opening up a window forcing you to watch as Emo Ret slides the window open and climbs through without your consent, okay, you don't choose to go in the window the moment you hit the key to open it, you're going in. So God forbid if there's somebody on the other side of that window. Which, oddly enough, <laughs> there never is because the developers knew this. They knew that you don't have any control over this action, so we're not going to put somebody in that area. Oh my god. They, they, why? I mean, you, you can't even pick up loot without the game resting control away from you. Nearly every action that isn't combat related is a can cutscene. The problem, you see, is control. Every time the game rests control away from me and I get caught by a guard, I don't feel like it's my fault. The goddamn game wouldn't let me play and Emerit moves like a sloth in these cutscenes. Why? Why did they do this? Hands. See, in an attempt to immerse you in the role of a thief, they allowed you to see your own body, feet, and hands. If you could see your hands, that means whenever you do something with them, you must see an animation that looks like your hands are actually doing something. And you know what? This game would have been amazing in VR, but it isn't in VR, and the design methodology is backwards. Thief is supposed to be about freedom. Just like Deus Ex, Thief puts you into a series of sandboxes and says to the player, find a thing. How you find that thing is up to you. You have the freedom to approach the game in any way you want. That's the point. But Thief 4 is all about taking control away from the player and limiting their choice in favor of what they call immersion. Now, I don't know about you, but my immersion was never broken because I couldn't see Garrett's hands in the original Thief. If anything, it was more immersive because the game wasn't wresting control away from me every moment of fucking gameplay. For an example of how to work immersion into an FPS, let's take a look at Resident Evil 7. You can see your hands, and you can open doors, but you control how much you open them. And in a survival horror game, that is just as important a mechanic as it is in a stealth FPS. Thief 4 fails utterly in immersing the player, not just because you have taken control away from the player, but because Garrett is constantly doing things that don't make any sense in context to who he is. He's a thief. Why isn't he being more sneaky? And let's go to number two, which is everything is contextual. 
You cannot do anything that Thief 4 does not want you to do. In Thief Gold, there was a very loose design to the levels. The level designers gave the player as many options as they could in an effort to encourage the player to try new things. This gives the game inherent replay value, something you hear studios crowing on constantly about because when a player stops playing your game, guess what? They're gonna likely never pick up your DLC. See, when confronted with the option to enter a building, Garrett would have three obvious entrance points, and sometimes one or more obscure ways to enter using rope arrows or mantling up to objects to scale a wall. The design of these levels err on the side of giving you more options. The 4 on the other hand, yeah, it delights in limiting what you can do through contextuality. Whether it is sealing off routes by telling you that you need a wrench to get through it, or by leaving areas under heavy guard, the game actively prevents you from feeling clever when you do something out of the ordinary. Now take the rope arrows, for instance. Rope arrows were a very useful tool in the original Thief games, not just for sequence breaking or gaining access to upper floors quickly, but they were also helpful for hiding from enemies. Now, the designers designed the levels with this in mind, but they couldn't take into account everything. The point of this tool was to lend even more freedom to the player in how they traverse the level. In Thief 4, <laughs> the levels are so tightly designed that rope arrows can only be used when the designer specifically wants you to be able to use them. And rope arrows now can only be used on these specific posts much like how Tomb Raider handled grappling, the problem with this is that you don't get a feeling that you were ever clever for finding this rope arrow spot. You just feel like this is what the designer wanted you to do. Not to mention, it's just lazy. And yet another way the game attempts to rip control away from you. It's lazy because it's a way to ensure the content that was designed for the player to experience doesn't accidentally get skipped by the industrious player. The irony here is that if they hadn't designed cutscenes into the level and made it such a linear experience, they wouldn't need to worry so much about sequence breaking. They could have spent more time designing options for the player, instead of constricting the player and forcing them down the path that they required of them. They managed to screw up the fucking blackjack. This is how bad it is. In previous Thief games, Blackjacking someone felt natural because the ray cast that the action button drew in the world was far enough in front of the player model that you rarely missed and never felt like you were placing your head in the guard's ass before you knocked them out. In Thief 4, you basically need to hug the guard before you can knock them out. And do you, do you actually do the knocking out, you ask? No, no, the game once again wrests control away from you to show you yet another cutscene of you brutally crushing someone's skull, then lovingly placing their head on the ground. Like an overwhelmed mother who just wanted their child to stop crying. And sometimes it doesn't work. I swear I have hit the Q button, and instead of knocking out a guard, he spots me. This happened so much in my playthrough that I nearly gave up completely. This to me is one of Thief 4's most egregious crimes. This blackjacking cutscene nearly takes five seconds to complete. And if you have ever played a Thief game, you know seconds are very valuable when attempting to take out a room full of patrolling guards. Then to make matters worse, you must then look down at the body and hold a button for what feels like an eternity if you wish to move the body. Oh fuck! This game is brutal! It had so much potential, but I feel like this is the number one thing that ruined the game. As far as I can remember, Thief was the first game to have a lean mechanic. Now, I'm sure other games came before it, I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. But this game was made for a PC, you see. Thief the Dark Project was a PC game, which meant that you had the span of an entire keyboard's worth of buttons to use. A lean left key and a lean right key. It felt natural to lean around walls, barrels, pillars, or just leaning out in the open to see around an archway. So how did Thief fuck this up? Well, contextuality, of course. You can only lean around objects that the level designers deemed worthy of leaning around. And in many cases, they forgot a lot of places. 
know, the game is once again taking control away from you so I could show you these cool little cutscenes all the time. Look, Emerit is putting his hands on the wall as he leans around. Wow, much dynamic, such cool. This is fucked up in so many ways that I could barely express myself. Take this clip, for example. I'm coming down some steps. As I approach the steps, my instinct is to lean. But the game won't let me, so I have to take a leap of faith and inch into the stairwell, even though I hear a voice coming from somewhere down there. I come down and I see someone to my right, but I can't lean around the cover, so I have no choice but to potentially expose myself if I hope to get the loot down there. Fortunately, he doesn't turn around and see me standing in the stairway, but he could have, and that's my point. And it wouldn't have been my fault. The lean button is supposed to be a tool that keeps me safe from detection. And here, it is useless. And at its worst, it's a liability. Breaking the leaning minigame is a crapshoot. Sometimes it works, other times it doesn't. Most of the time, I'm leaning around something where a guard is and I see him coming towards me. I try to break the lean, but sometimes it doesn't. And I spend precious seconds screaming at Garrett to let go of the fucking wall! Not to mention leaning around corners. It's not even useful. When it does work, look, look at what this game calls leaning. You can't even see what's in the next room. Compare this to OG Thief and you'll see that Garrett can literally snake his head around the corner to see in nearly 360 degrees. Again, in a game that is supposed to be all about freedom, the devs took your freedom away and forced you to play the way they wanted you to. You can't even jump when you want to. Even the act of jumping to a ledge has been meticulously planned by the devs. See a ledge that you want to jump to? Well, you better hope that the devs wanted you to jump there, or you might end up jumping to the street in front of a guard. Now let's go to number three. Everything is valuable, sort of? See, Garrett, since the last time we saw him, he's become a hoarder. He steals everything from hairbrushes to forks. Nothing's off limits to Garrett. Also, I think he's shoving all these items up his ass because I have no idea where he's putting all this shit. Maybe this is Forgotten Realms and Garrett has a bag of holding, but he can only put junk inside of it. You know, the stuff that he steals isn't even worth stealing. A fork that sells for two gold? Are you serious? A pen? A mirror? Where are you putting all this stuff? And how do you not sound like shaking a bag of nickels every time you walk? That just gives you more incentive to explore, you might be saying to yourself, really? See, what I learned about this game really early on was that it isn't worth putting myself in danger to get that glimmering object near a guard because it wouldn't be worth anything. Instead, I only stole what was on my way to the objective and the game throws so much trash at you that I had more than enough money at the end of the level to buy whatever I wanted from the store and you know what the fucked up thing was? I didn't want anything! The issue stems from how unimportant loot becomes. In the original Thief, every piece of loot was important. Not just because the quest needed you to steal a certain amount, but because you needed that money to buy supplies between levels. And because your money wasn't pooled together, and you didn't keep any after a level, every level became a treasure hunt because you, if you didn't steal enough loot in one mission, the next mission would be that much harder. Now you could technically finish every mission without buying anything, but for the first time player, treasure maps Detailed maps of undocumented areas, healing potions, flash bombs, fire arrows, moss arrows, water arrows. Those were all nice, and they opened up more options for how you tackled a level and made them arguably easier to finish. In Thief 4, not only are you showered in loot, but that money is pulled over the entire course of the game. So eventually you'll have so much money that you'll never need to worry about it, especially after you buy the wrench, the clippers, and the razor. Eventually, loot just becomes another in a series of annoyances that this game throws at you. Watching a two-second cutscene every time you want to steal something gets really old quick. Now, if you want an even easier experience than what is already there, Thief 4 gives you the option to buy upgrades to your armor, your bow, all of that. Why would you want this game to be any easier than it is? And that brings me to number four. Everything is simplified. You can see through walls. What else do I need to say about this? The whole point of Thief was that you needed to be careful when traversing levels because you were a weak, frail little man who could barely swing a sword right. Taking on more than one guard in Thief Gold? Yeah, it would end in your death as a first time player, not to mention the blood gets everywhere and its cleanup is expensive. So not only can you see through walls in Thief 4, 
so you never need to worry about being careful. But even if you get caught, combat's a joke. They turned combat into a rhythm game. Press button to dodge. Press button to dodge. Press button to dodge and shoot face. Shoot face. See that? The AI is brain dead. You see me pulling back an arrow and aiming at your head, yet you stand there waiting for me to do it. Oh my God, not to mention that if I wanted to, I could have sat there all day dodging their attacks because combat is so forgiving, there is no point in being stealthy. Now let's say you're a troglodyte born with fingers that bend out in every direction and seeing through walls and easy combat isn't easy enough, is not enough hand holding for you. Well guess what chump, you can upgrade your focus so that not only can you see people through walls but now you can see loot through them as well. You can upgrade the rate at which your focus meter depletes which gives you even more time to x-ray vision your way through the game and if that isn't enough. You can upgrade nearly every action in the game, making it easier to do everything, including a one-hit knockout in combat when you're detected. Pile on top of this an absolutely OP skill that allows you to detect sounds visibly, and you got a game for babies. Not just that, but the map tells you way too much info and the waypoint system leads you to your objective without you needing to explore at all. Now. Thankfully, the game comes with a custom difficulty mode in which you could turn off a lot of this hand-holding altogether, but that doesn't fix the level design that was designed around these systems. I played a game and I turned off all of that shit. I even turned up the expense of items that you buy from the stores. Why did I do this? Because I wanted all of the obvious problems that this game had to become very clear to me. And by doing that, it became really clear that this game just it wasn't designed like a thief game. I mean, the entire game was designed to take all of these options that you're being given into account. It turned turning things off doesn't provide a better experience because now you just get lost in a terribly designed open world. Now, if that wasn't enough, the game has an added meter that fills up when a guard sees you and until it is full, they don't go into an alert phase. The meter fills a second time and then the guard goes into attack mode. Now, this is similar to what Thief did in, the, in that the guards typically went into phases. So for instance, if they hear something, they go into alert and start looking for what caused the noise or whatever was moving in the shadows. If they find you, they go into alert mode. That's all great and all, but Thief 4 has a UI element that tells you that a guard can see you no matter what direction you're facing. You don't need to be aware of your surroundings anymore because the game is doing that for you. The shit sandwich isn't even done yet. There's even another layer of dumbing down here, shadows. There seems to be three states in the game when it comes to visibility. Slightly invisible, visible, and clearly visible. In Thief Gold, there were three levels, black, yellow, and red, representing the same thing as Thief 4. Where these games differ is in the way it handles visibility in game. Look at how long it takes for this guard to see me standing in clear view. Okay, all right, he's looking a little away from me. How about this guy in a guard tower? I am standing in the street in clear view. And even though he was staring right at me, it still takes him that long to see me. For contrast in Thief Gold, if you did this kind of thing, the guard sees you immediately and starts to come after you. I'm not done yet. I got more shit to say about the stealth in this game. The shadow system in this game is broken. Half of the time when I'm traversing a level, I can't tell if a patch of land I'm about to walk into is going to be in shadow. Now take a look at this scene and tell me, do you think this area I'm about to walk into is shadow? It looks pretty bright, right? That can't be shadow. But if you thought that, you'd be wrong. It is considered shadow. Other times, the same level of brightness will be considered exposed. It seems to me, and I could be wrong here, but whether you are visible or not isn't dependent on the lighting values in the level, but is more down to whether the level design determines it. It's as if the game is using shadow volumes that determine if you are hidden instead of going off the brightness value of where you're standing. It's bizarre and inconsistent. If you're standing in a lighted area and I am in dark, you should be able to see your surroundings but I shouldn't be able to see much aside from you. If I'm in a dark room that has no light, it should be hard for me to see anything. But in Thief 4, everything appears to be lit and because that harsh contrast of light versus dark doesn't exist, 
it is very hard to tell whether or not you're going to be hidden in any given location. I mean, what the fuck? This is the main selling point of this game. Now, you can adjust the brightness levels and all that, and that's fine and good, but at a certain point, you reduce the brightness, you start to lose levels of contrast. In this clip, you will see a prime example of what I'm talking about here. Look at where I'm standing. I am in complete darkness, yet the gem shows me fully exposed. Now here I am in the same amount of shadow, and it says I'm partially exposed. But if I just move two steps away from that location in the same level of shadow, I am now fully invisible. What the hell is going on here? This is a game about sneaking around in shadows, but you can't even do that reliably? So what they did is give you a bunch of tools to make this broken ass game playable, and they hoped you wouldn't notice you were playing a broken game. And you might not have noticed it, but your brain did. This is dumbed down stealth, and it is way too forgiving. Why did they do this? Well, I think they had to, because Garrett has gone deaf from listening to Glassjaw at full volume while cutting himself. Wow. Number five, everything is silent. No more footsteps. No more sounds of any kind. You can't even blame this on consoleification. Surround sound is great for games, and they use positional audio. And while this game has hints of positional audio, it's actually non existent. Okay? To top it all off, you can't hear when somebody is approaching you at all. So you could be walking down a hallway, and unless a guard is humming to himself, you could get caught because he popped out of a room and you didn't hear his footsteps. You know how many times I've come around a corner just to run straight into a guard as I came around? Sure, I could have leaned, but the time the lean cutscene finished playing, the guard would have been right on top of me, and the game has trained me not to depend on leaning, so at this point in the game, I'm not even doing it anymore. I've touched on this in my Thief Gold video. Sound was Garrett's weapon and his best tool. Garrett could hear like a safe cracker. He could hear footsteps down a long hallway, so even if he couldn't see what was coming, by listening to how loud the footsteps were getting, you could still tell if the thing in the hallway was coming towards you or walking away from you. This game simply has no footsteps. I'm not exaggerating. It actually seems like the footstep sound effects are actually missing. For a moment, I thought maybe my speakers and headphones were broken. So I went out into the World Wide Web and started searching. It seems that the number one complaint the Thief 4 players had is the sound. Chapter 4 has some of the worst sound design I think I have ever heard in a AAA game. This isn't justice! And listen to these two guys talking. The guy getting hanged is clear as a bell, but the guy standing no more than a foot behind him sounds like he's whispering. Peach and Neroli. They're good girls. Then I expect that to be reflected in your contribution. But you already upped the black tax twice this quarter. There are times, even in cutscenes, when it seems like there was supposed to be sounds accompanying things happening, but you hear nothing. And it is not only distracting, but it takes you right out of the scene. And then in a cutscene with Orion, well, <laughs> suffice to say that if the scene didn't have closed captioning on, I wouldn't know what these asshats were saying. What? How? What? How? <laughs> In playing this game, I began to think I was going deaf. If you were to still have all the other items above, all of the improvements, quote, all the bullshit cutscenes, the weird shadow system, all of that, if the sound was good and we could hear where people were, this game still would have at least been playable because that was all a Thief reboot needed. First and foremost, we didn't need all this fancy shit, auto maps, waypoints, quick time events, and cutscenes all the time. All we needed was that one thing, sound, and they couldn't even get that thing right. Now let's talk about execution. Now see, I really wanted to end the video there, like, but when I ran across chapter 3, I couldn't. See, I thought the story was just bland, but it turns out, it's broken. 
And when I say broken, I mean cutscenes have missing sounds, broken scene logic, weird cuts, and not just all that, but a nonsensical story that leads nowhere. What is the story, you might ask? I asked the same thing when I saw the ending cutscene for this game. Okay, so let's set this up. We need to run through each chapter so that I can break down why this shit makes no sense. On the surface, it seems that there is a story here, but there really isn't. It's really just a series of events that happens that Garrett happens to take part in. There's a MacGuffin that does a thing, but we don't know why it does a thing, or why we should care, or what the primal even is. So let's dig into the story now. Chapter 1 We meet Garrett hanging out in some dude's house. He steals some stuff, breaks into a house full of birds, steals more shit than his emo girlfriend or sister who knows, the relationship between these two people becomes real fuzzy once Chapter 6 kicks in. But for now, it would appear Garrett doesn't really like this chick. Nah. And she does a lot to be thoroughly unlikable. Like when she kills a guard just for existing. She didn't need to, it just seems like she liked it. <laughs> cool! Why'd you kill this guard? He was barely older than you. He was a guard, Garrett. Wrong place, wrong time. You haven't changed, have you? Really like this chick, hoping we get to see more of her. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 So, long story short, she's a bitch. I hate her. She falls through a glass roof, and I couldn't be more happy. She gets back fucked by a ghost or something, and Garrett swings in like Indiana Jones, fade to black. When we come to, we're in the back of a cart. So Garrett is not only dressed exactly the same as he was when he fell through the roof, but he still has Emo Girl's Claw Club. Lots of things are starting to not make a whole lot of sense by the end of this chapter, but we don't know that yet. See, when I first played this game, I figured he somehow made it out of that place and stowed away in those guys' cart. But no, they knew about him, and were so loyal to him that they both likely died trying to save him. I guess Garrett is a pretty popular guy now. He wasn't in the first game, really, but hey, whatever. But like I said, at this point, I didn't know the whole story. For all I know, it isn't a year later. It's the same night as the incident with Aaron. The one thing I do know, Garrett believes Aaron is dead, and he doesn't seem all that broken up about it. In fact, he comments on how incompetent she was as a thief after she died. That claw is fairly quiet when used the right way. Aaron made this thing sound noisier than it is. Garrett makes it back to the clock tower, and there's a nice little hint that he hasn't been there for a while, because he runs his fingers along the post, and there's a thick layer of dust as well as a bunch of messages on his windowsill. One of them asks, where the hell are you? Implying he's been gone for a while. But we still have no idea how long he's been gone. So we need to make our way to the crippled Burrick Inn and talk to our fence, Basso. Or if you're familiar with the original game, Basso the Boxman. Garrett rescued Basso from Crags Clef Prison because he owed him for the Baffer job and because he wanted to drill out Basso's sister like an oil well. In this current incarnation, Basso is Garrett's fence and a sort of manager, giving him jobs to do and keeping Garrett employed. Now I have to point out just a few things here. First is Garrett's eye. See, that is not his eye, not his real eye. It is the eye that was inserted into his skull when his real one was cut out by the trickster and his minion. By the look of Garrett, he's not much older than he was in the original Thief game. But the world seems completely different. For one, there's no hammerites. No 
pagans. That you wish to fight? Me? Or my Thistleades? Oh, or the Sycamore? Just you. None of the old factions exist anymore. Now, admittedly, I have not played through all of Deadly Shadows because of load screens. So maybe the factions were destroyed at the end of that game. But without them, or even a mention of them, it's a little jarring when you realize Garrett still has that eye. How did he get the eye? Or the scars around his eye. This must be a sequel, but you don't even acknowledge that the previous games existed. Where are the Keepers? Are they gone too? I mean, where does the story eventually go? I mean, I can think of about three separate occasions where Garrett could have met with the Keepers. I also refuse to believe that the Keepers wouldn't have involved themselves in an event this catastrophic. Now, all that aside, Garrett and Basso have a little heart-to-heart -heart where Basso asks Garrett where he's been, and Garrett replies, I don't know. Okay, so we've confirmed that Garrett doesn't know where he's been. How long he's been gone for. Eh, maybe it's been like a couple hours. Far be it for me to pry about where you've been for the last fucking year. I should have let you... What the fuck? Okay, first, why isn't Garrett asking questions right now, like... I've been gone for a year? Are you sure? Like, why is he not at all curious about this? No, instead of trying to figure out what happened to him, what happened to Aaron, or even what the hell is going on, he asked for a job. Now, I wondered a few things at this point. I'm going to list them out, and we'll see if these questions are ever resolved by the end. Number one, how did Garrett make it out of that place alive? Number two, why doesn't he remember getting out of that place alive or the last year? Number three, where was he for the last year? Number four, was he in a coma? Number five, why was he in that cart? Number six, where were the guys with that corpse cart taking him, and why were they risking their lives for him? And number seven, who has been keeping him safe for that entire year? And number eight, how can he walk after being asleep for an entire year? Now, for the most part, they answer almost all of that, but not the coma part. See, right after talking to Basso, we get to go see Granny Rags. I mean, I don't know, some old bitch. They exchange some meaningless dialogue, and about the pathless traveled, Granny Rags asks us if we know what people say about her. Unprompted, I might add. She just asks out of the blue, like this were a quiz. Garrett responds by telling her that she knows everything that happens in this city. Now, folks, this is what we call an exposition dump. See, Garrett is here to get info, and really... That's all we need to know. This could have been organic, but nothing about Garrett's dialogue is straightforward nothing. The game thinks it's clever, and it's trying to show us all the time. Anyway, Garrett asks uh, Granny Rags what she knows about the job a year ago at Northcrest, and instead of answering the fucking question he asked, she answers a question he didn't ask. I'm with you, Garrett. I'm just as frustrated. Finally, she answers the question. So they healed his broken body. How it was broken is not said. But they answered one of my questions. Was he in a coma? Yep. So how is he walking around? He was asleep for a year. His muscles would have atrophied. Also, patients who've been in a coma for little more than a week have reported that they were in a, quote, delusional dream world that took nearly a month to become self-aware again. It took that patient, by their accounts, seven weeks to be able to walk again. You don't just get out of bed after a year in a coma and start scaling walls again. That's my point. You'll be lucky if you could sit up in your bed or remember your fucking name. I know what you're saying. It's a game. Suspend your disbelief. 
Okay, fine. I could do that up to a point. I just find it odd that the devs thought it was a good idea to make him be in a coma for a year. Because a year introduces a lot of problems into your story and it doesn't enhance it. It's a puzzling decision to make. Later on, as Garrett is crossing a yard with a poppy plant in the middle, he has a vision of Aaron and hears her calling his name. Okay, this is fine. Maybe he's delusional, right? After a romp in the corpse processing facility, we are treated to a cutscene. And this is where the what the fuck moments start coming. The Sheriff of Nottingham walks in and up to the body we are there to steal the ring from and searches the hands. He looks at the guard who was processing the body and asks him, What did this body have on it? Uh, nothing. Implying that the guard must have stolen the ring. It's obvious to me that he doesn't have it because he looks completely confused. Now the general takes a meat cleaver, which is inexplicably there, I mean, are they using that on the bodies? I, I was expecting a general to threaten or kill the guard with it and then take the ring off of his body, but instead, he takes the guard's hand, wraps it around the cleaver, and forces the guard to cut a hole in the corpse's stomach. When the guard pulls back, he has the ring in his hand. Now, I assume he pulled it from the corpse's stomach. So this means the guard didn't steal the ring. Cool. But the general shoots the fucking guard anyway. Why? Why are you shooting a guard that didn't do anything wrong? You know, I don't ask for much. What? What? What did you ask him to do? Did you ask the guy to open up corpses and look for rings? Is that what you asked for? I'm totally confused by this. What didn't he do? You never set this up. And without provocation, without any reason, the general shoots a man who is just doing his job? Is this characterization? Are you showing us that the general is a guy that we should hate? If so, job well done. I hate him, but not for the reasons you wanted, but because he's a terrible cartoon villain. You should have made the guy twirl his mustache. Garrett breaks into the general's office and has an acid flashback about Planet of the Apes. Cornelius. And our friend, the general, surprises us. Which I guess makes sense. Garrett is deaf now, after all. This won't be the first time he's surprised by the guy with the cane and the limp and the peg leg. Despite my complaints, these early missions are actually kind of fun. Now, they aren't fun in a thief way, like choosing your own adventure, but more like fun in a linear, spectacle kind of way. There seems to be a bit of polish to the game, and the, the encounters and guard placements make a measure of sense. I thought all of this until I got to chapter 3 and the sleek veneer started to peel away and reveal the rotten, termite-infested wood beneath. Chapter 3 Scene opens up with Garrett getting another message from Basso. Orion, the guy we stole the ring for earlier, wants a book. While Garrett is talking to Orion, however, he gets a headache and passes out. When he wakes up, Orion tells Garrett that the book he needs is hidden somewhere in a house of blossoms, which is a brothel. A brothel? Sweet! Finally an open-ended area that I can explore- Nope. Chapter 3 is a long level, but that doesn't mean it's good. It just means it's long. Just take a look at the map of this level. This is the first area in the game that takes place in a house. But just take a look at how linear this level is. In the first area, there are two paths. One path that you will take, and one path that you would be stupid to take. Why? Because the other path is guarded, and the other isn't. So path B isn't even an option. This level is a brothel. It's a big mansion with multiple levels, and several rooms where people are getting high on opium and fucking. This level could have been completely open-ended. Like a thief level. It would have been really fun as well, but instead of being fun, it's a slog through a linear series of areas. Look at this map. You are spit out at A or B, depending on the route you took. Look how close they are together. The only reason to take one path over the other is to avoid guards. So what is the incentive to take any other route? There is none, because no matter what path you took, they converge into one point. The point of branching paths is to give the player an option as to where they want to infiltrate from. If these paths led to a different point on the map, then the player has a choice. With this system, 
The only choice a player has is whether or not they want guards or no guards. It's not really a choice. You are given an option to flood the place with opium. Again, this is a non-choice. Because if you don't flood the place with opium, you're just making things harder on yourself. Because there are no repercussions for your actions. If you knock everyone out with opium, nothing bad happens to you. You don't lose loot, as far as I know. You don't miss story beats. You just get an easier route through the place. Basically, if you don't use opium, it's likely because you didn't know you could. If you look through a peephole in this area, you're going to get treated to a cutscene with a circus clown and the sheriff of Nottingham. Now, listen to this scene. Peach and Neroli, they're good girls. Then I expect that to be reflected in your contribution. But you already upped the black tax twice this quarter. The trouble on the streets is making life be a shame if the opium trade started experiencing delivery problems to this address. Did you did you notice anything? Listen close. Good. If I have to wait, then I'll have a bit on the house. Something young and uh, juicy. I shall call Jasmine Blossom. Jasmine's getting too old. I want something younger. No. How about now? Yeah, no, it's not your headphones. The sound mixing is broken. This is what I mean when I say that the shiny veneer is starting to peel. At this point, the production value of this game takes a long walk off a short bridge. This scene offers nothing except to tell us that the general is a pedo and likes fucking kids. Oh God, this guy is officially snidely whiplash. I get it, game. You really want me to hate this guy. Mission accomplished. At the end of the brothel area, you're spit out into some underground caves and you get to look through peepholes and see people mushing their sex parts together. And further in, you see some creepy creature and you do some puzzles and grab a book, then this shit. Punish me, mother. I've been bad, so bad. The Sheriff of Nottingham, Thief Taker General, whatever that means, this guy is a cartoon. In Chapter 3, we find him again, being a stereotypical bad guy number 10, guy with a mommy complex, and he starts beating a hooker. First, I want to point out something. How the fuck did I wind up under the bed? One moment I'm in a cave, climbing up a ledge, and the next moment, I'm under a bed. I need to linger on this for a moment. Notice how jarring this cut is? That's because typically when you transition from one setting to a completely different setting, an establishing shot is used. An establishing shot is used to tell the audience, okay everyone, we're in a new area now. See, we're in a bedroom, and there's a guy raw dog and a hooker. Then we cut to Garrett, crawling in under the bed. But with this shot, we get Garrett entering a wide open tunnel, then a hard cut to Garrett underneath a bed somewhere that hasn't been established yet. The effect on us, the viewer, is sort of like Garrett has been teleported from one location to the other. I know I've lingered on this for a while, but so much of this game up to this point was fairly solid, and now, it's falling apart. So Sheriff Baldspot starts beating this hooker, and before he hits her, a slapping sound effect plays. Or <laughs> the circus clown from earlier comes in and puts a knife to his balls. Meanwhile, they have knocked over a lantern and a place is catching fire. Now this is good. See, so far Garrett is up a tree, and now the game is throwing rocks at him. Sheriff discovers him hiding under the bed. This guy with a gimpy ass leg manages to find the power, the sheer strength in his thighs, to flip the bed into the air, making it tumble end over end clear across the room like the Incredible Hulk throwing a car. I thought this guy had a limp. How did he find the power in his thighs to flip a bed like that? There was something else that bothered me about this scene, but I couldn't tell at first. See, see if you could tell what it is. Somehow, even though Garrett was under the bed, he somehow gets trapped against the wall under the bed again. Look, look, just, just look at this. They had to use choppy editing to get away with this. 
there was no way for Garrett to have become stuck under that bed. Maybe he rolled out, you say. Eh, why would he do that? He didn't start rolling before the sheriff flipped the bed, so he must have teleported again. Garrett in this game is able to handle a fight with three guards with only a blackjack to help him. You mean to tell me that he's afraid of a fist fight with Sheriff Alopecia over here? Anyway, he gets pinned against the wall once again, failing utterly at being a master thief, and instead of killing us on the spot, the Thief Taker General does what every cliched villain should do. You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't believe it! And because he talks about what he's going to do instead of doing it, we escape. Again. Chapter 4. Back at the Hall of Justice, Garrett is looking down an arrow shaft for some reason, when he discovers a dying bird. Because of this, he knows something must be wrong with Basso. Not that the bird got attacked by a hawk or something on the way there, but that Basso must be in trouble. Alrighty then. It's flimsy, but it gets the job done. Now we have to break Basso out of prison, again. But this time, with 95% less fun, we make our way to the crippled Burrick to find Orion there, searching for the book we stole, but Basso isn't there. Garrett is somehow suspicious of Orion now, and does his best Christian Bale impression. Where are they? What's so important about it? Now Orion says something very important in the scene. You see, he says, oh, in, I believe there is the key to saving this city, saving all of us from the gloom. Okay, so let me let me get this straight. Orion wanted the ring and the book in order to find a cure for the plague that is killing people in the city. The gloom, they call it. Before Orion can take the book, Garrett asks where they've taken Basso. But getting in will not be easy, predictably. We must find a guy named Jacob who knows how to get into a fortress. But before that happens... We're not so different, you and I. That's right! With that line, this game officially wins the cliched Game of the Year Award 2014. It was a tough year, people, but Thief 4 really put in a good showing and came out on top with that one. Seriously, when I heard that line, I sighed. It was at this point that I checked online to see how many missions were in the game. I was dismayed to find out I'd be playing five more missions. So let's quickly blow through this stuff because it is busy work that doesn't reveal anything. Jacob is dead in the town square. Eastwick is the architect of the keep. We go there, infiltrate the mansion. He's killed himself. We steal the plans. Guards burst in. We do some action hero shit. Some shit blows up. Next part of the mission commences. <sighs> we infiltrate the exploding keep where Basso is being held. Walk into a hallway. Hard cut to a cut scene that is once again not established in any way. One minute we're walking towards a closed cell door. The next minute it's open and Basso is walking away with us. Cool. Now rewind here. I want to show you that I'm not crazy because you might be saying to yourself, well, maybe the door was open already. No, look, see, see here. That is Basso. That is his cell door. It is closed. We don't see it open. It's jarring and half ass like so much of this game. Oh, why am I doing this to myself? I'm reviewing Thief 4. Why? I could be reading a book or masturbating. What am I doing with my life? I'm not crazy though. This game had to be rushed out the door because look at this. Garrett moves his lips but no sound comes out. Then Basso replies to words that are not even said. So Garrett decides that he's going to go after the safe in the Sheriff of Nottingham's castle because it is quote, who I am. Garrett tries to open his safe and before he can, the Master Thief is once again ambushed by a guy with a peg leg and a cane and gets an arrow through his hand. Once again, Garrett is deaf, and the sheriff is a better sneak than he is. Let's go back a little bit here. Now this game seems to have the bones of a good story, right? Garrett is being led through these story beats through cause and effect. Garrett steals the ring and the book because he's being paid for it. And because he steals the ring and the book, Basso is taken hostage. Because he is being held in the fort with a fabled treasure vault, Garrett naturally wants to break in. But where everything starts to turn to shit is when the game goes from having a because structure to an and then structure. See, because Garrett breaks into the safe, he finds a jewel. And then he has a vision. In that vision, 
Aaron calls him Big Brother, and it seems like a term of endearment, but it isn't said explicitly, so I don't know. Is she his sister? Who knows? Garrett goes through a vision quest, and then Aaron tells him to come to Moira Asylum. And then he finds the jewel piece. Why is this an and then and not a because story beat? Because none of this happens because Garrett stole the ring and the book. This happens because he broke into the vault, and then all the causal chains start to fracture into other chains that don't link up perfectly. See, there is very little reason for Garrett to continue on at this point. We've established that Garrett isn't a fan of Aaron, and neither are we. So why would we risk our necks seeking out information on Aaron? He hasn't been at all concerned about her since she fell through the glass. I d didn't even think to confirm that she was dead or not. Garrett didn't die, so why would she have? Again, another flimsy reason to do a thing. Chapter 5 We go to the asylum and get some bog-standard jump scares, learn some stuff about what they were doing to Aaron here, torturing her, trying to draw out something called the Primal. Shit goes bad and suddenly all the lunatics are freed from the asylum. Now, a couple questions. This place looks like it's been abandoned for a long time, and these guys have been locked up in their cells for what seems like a long time. What did they eat? I mean, I mean, how did they survive all of this time in these solitary cells? Are they real, or is Garrett hallucinating all this? I have no clue. This shit doesn't make any sense. Garrett deduces that Aaron is alive, and then the game becomes all about finding Aaron. Not about Orion. No, he's secondary to Garrett's desire all of a sudden to find Aaron. Garrett escapes the lunatics and then takes an elevator to the basement. Why didn't he leave the way he came in? Well, someone said they were taking, and I quote, her down to the prison level when Garrett was hallucinating. Since the game is now about Aaron and not about Orion and his revolution, we go to the prison level. And from here on out, all of our information in the game is delivered through hallucinations. Super! And then we see some creepy monster guys. And I have to say, you know, I was generally shook up by this part a little bit. I mean, it was pretty well designed and had some tense moments where I was sure I was going to get caught. And it was actually kind of a good mechanic if the game had any sounds in it. You see, these monsters find you not by sight, but by sound. The problem is, you can't hear your footsteps, so you have no idea how loud you're being. So after a jump scare in a hallway, we hallucinate again, and then we get the next bit of story. Turns out Garrett thinks all the monsters in the asylum were created by Aaron, though I'm not sure why. It was probably in some letter I picked up and didn't bother to read. Now, we find out through the hallucination, of course, that the Baron was involved in a scheme to do something with something to the emo girl. So for the last two missions, we are finding clues to where we need to go next through a hallucination that is triggered by walking into a particular room. These cutscenes only happen because we go to the asylum, but the asylum is not important in and of itself. It is only there to impart information. Do this for a minute. Replace asylum with library. Replace Asylum with Playground. Replace Asylum with any location at all and ask yourself, could this hallucination have happened in any of those locations? Yes, it could. Yes, it could. We didn't need to go to an asylum. It wasn't pivotal. We went there because the developers thought it would be cool. Ask yourself this. Why did they take the girl to an asylum to extract the primal? I mean, the Baron knows about the stone, the book, and the ring. He says it in Chapter 6. That means he knows that the primal transferred to the girl through the stone, and he knew if Orion got the stones and the girl, Orion could unleash the primal. Seems like it would have been more important to get the stones. So if his goal was to extract the primal, but he didn't have the stones, what does taking her to the asylum do aside from set up a bunch of jump scares? What technological wonder did the asylum have that no other facility had that would help in the extracting of the primal. I'm glad you asked. A chair with straps attached to it. Holy shit! Good thing you went to the asylum! Chapter 6 You go to see the Baron, and Garrett, being the master thief, 
can't even sneak up on an old man who wasn't even looking at him. Now this is where shit gets real confusing. So the Baron bangs on about the stones and how when it shattered, the primal transferred to Aaron. Then something weird happens. He says that Orion had Garrett steal the stone from the keep. No, he didn't. <laughs> we stole the stone because we wanted to break into the vault. Was Orion depending on us to break into the vault to get the stone? What if we didn't? Wouldn't that have fucked everything up? Now there are three pieces of this stone. One of the stones is in a vault. Another is in a laboratory that I guess is below the Baron's manor. That's two pieces. Here's the confusing part. At the end of the game, the jewel is in three pieces. Before we go to the library, however, the Baron says, You're I. You were there. You're the missing piece. So hang on. Are we, meaning Garrett's body, the missing piece? Or is his I? I don't know what's up here. If we fast forward to the end of the mission, when Granny Rag sneaks up on Garrett because he's deaf, before she says anything to him, he is looking at his eye in a mirror. What does his eye have to do with this? Well, I'm glad you asked because I had no fucking clue. It's never explained. Granny Rags tells Garrett that he has seen the missing piece. Garrett answers back. Orion says that I have the missing piece. Well, I thought Garrett was the missing piece. What did his eye have to do with it? Why was he looking at his eye in the mirror? What is going on with this story? I feel like I'm going insane. Chapter 7. Garrett infiltrates the chapel in an attempt to steal the last piece of the jewel. We watch a cutscene where Orion is pretending to heal sick with a dream catcher. Still no sign of the jewel. Then we get to hallucinate again. We do some boring shit and bam, there's the last piece of the jewel. Okay, so one second. Where did he get the jewel from? The hallucination? Why did he need to go see Orion to get that final piece? I thought he was supposed to be stealing it from him. So let me get this straight. In the hallucination, we walk up to Orion casually and take the jewel from him. Or did the jewel teleport from his hands to ours because we picked it up in the hallucination? I, then wouldn't you know it, the Sheriff of Nottingham shows up and you get to do one of the worst, dumbest, bullshittiest boss fights I've ever seen. You can't defeat him by sneaking up on him because once you do it the first time, he can no longer be harmed that way. So if you don't have arrows, like I didn't. If you want to kill him, you got to do it hand to hand. And you know what? I'm sure it's possible. The sheriff has a one hit crossbow kill and a push move that he uses to create space. Every time I got him close to dead, bam, one shot kill. Eventually I just snuck away because I wanted the raping of thief to end. I was tired of seeing it bent over the table. Now you've gotten to the end of the seventh mission and one question has still not been answered. Well, a lot of things haven't been answered, but the most important question, the one that the entire story hinges on, hasn't been answered. What about the primal makes Orion believe it can heal the sick? First off, it is called the primal. That doesn't sound like a good name, okay? But after the asylum incident, wouldn't Orion know from his brother that the primal makes monsters and not much else? Uh, maybe he didn't, but it has never explained why this guy believes it can heal the sick. Has there been an example of it healing the sick? Why haven't we seen it? Is it in an obscure letter somewhere? In a book I didn't read? Is there some fan fiction on the interwebs I could read that explains it all? If it isn't in the game, and it isn't something that is shown to me, I don't care. Chapter 8 Finally we come to the end. I'm not going to waste a whole lot of your time. Orion has a gigantic ship for some unexplained half-baked reason that really isn't explained. You find him on the unfinished part of the boat, Aaron kills him. You have another boss fight with her, you win. You use the stone to suck out the evil thing that never seemed like a real threat throughout the game, and you get one of the lamest endings I have ever seen in a game, period. Look at this transition. One minute you're against the wall, the next minute she's hanging off the edge of the boat with you holding on to her. How did we go from here to here. Where's the establishing shot? My god! She falls to her presumed death. Garrett throws the claw to her as she falls. And Garrett passes out. I guess. When he wakes up, the claw is in the wooden post next to him with a muddy footprint. The end. 
Okay, so hang on. What is the resolution? You make it seem like Aaron survives, but did the primal survive? Is it still inside of her? I mean, probably not, but you haven't established that. Instead, you show a cutscene of Garrett watching the sun and expect that to be some poignant ending? Are you telling me that the entire point of this game was to save Aaron, a girl, a girl that our character saw as a nuisance in the first chapter? What about the fucking primal? Is it sealed in the jewel? Where does the jewel go from here? Does Garrett keep it? Does he ever see Aaron again? Who the fuck knows? Watch this sunset. It's sad that Thief had this happen to it. We will probably never see another Thief game, and despite all of my complaints, this setting actually had some potential, though I will admit it was nowhere near as good as the OG Thief game setting. Not even close. This game had very little in the way of personality or originality, and it seemed to be banking on our nostalgia. Once again, they could have drawn from the source material instead of scrapping it all and starting over. But that's what they did, and there's no going back. Oh well, just goes to show you. You could try to imitate an original, but the copy will never be as good. This has been a rant from Strategy, and now that you've heard it, go play some games.